All right, let's get started. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining today's webinar, um, How We Want to Feel at Home, Creating a Family Charter. My name is Ashton Killalay, and I'm with the Center for Emotional Intelligence. Um, today, I have the pleasure of introducing our presenters, Elisa Ludati. She's a program manager of Ruler for Families and Partner Schools, and Catherine Lee, who's the director of Ruler for Families. Uh, before I turn it over to our presenters, I just want to remind everyone um, to add any comments or questions that you have to the Q&A or the chat function, um, and we can have our presenters address them. Um, we're going to do one stop in the middle um, of the presentation, and then we'll have more time for questions at the end. Um, also, a recording of the webinar will be sent um, and available within two business days uh, for viewing. So without further ado, Elisa and Catherine, the floor is yours. Okay, welcome. We're happy that you're here with us this afternoon. And um, let's get started. So my name is Catherine Lee, as um, Ashton said, and I'm the Director of Ruler for Families. My background is in early childhood development and um, education. And in my current role, we develop resources and pathways for ruler schools to be able to engage families as they learn the skills of emotional intelligence so that families have the benefit of learning right along together with them. And we think this creates the best support for children. And I'm also the mom of a grown son and, um, and the, an auntie to many wonderful nieces and nephews. And I'm Elisa Ladati. I am the program manager for Ruler for Families and Partner Schools. And I work with Catherine to develop resources for families and also with school teams to implement Ruler, which is our approach to social and emotional learning. My background is as a school psychologist and I've worked in public school settings, grades K through 12. And I'm also the proud mom of two young boys. And those are my little nuggets there. <laughs> So we'd like to know a little bit more about you. Um, we do know that uh, many of you are educators, parents, educators and parents, but what we'd like to know is what are the ages of your children or the ages of uh, children you work with? And that way we can make the, the webinar most meaningful and relevant for you. So if you could just share in the chat box, um, what are the ages of your children or children you work with, preschool age, elementary age, middle school or high school? Okay, so we have K through four, K through 12, eight month old twins, fourth grade, elementary, three and four year olds, middle school, elementary school, independent elementary school, high school, third grade, first, third and fifth grade. I'm a preschool teacher and I have a five year old and an 11 year old. Great. Pre-K, so second grade, looks like we have a large range of folks. Yeah, it looks like we um, have children of all ages. Um, so we'll try to make sure that we incorporate examples uh, from all ages so that way um, you can see how this applies in your family and in your homes. So it wouldn't be a webinar with the Center for Emotional Intelligence if we didn't ask this question. How are you feeling? How are you feeling right now uh, about your life at home, about your family life? Take a moment, check in with yourself. What emotions are you feeling? Um, Maybe it's um, one emotion, likely it's a few. If you could just share in the chat box, um, I'd love to hear from you. Chill, anxious, uneasy, stressful, grateful, spent, tense at home, I'm in the blue green, overwhelmed, anxious, but lucky. Um, stressed, anxious, overwhelmed, happy to be home with their kids, but also stressed out, frustrated. Yeah, I mean, on a daily basis, I, I can honestly say I felt all of those things. It's a roller coaster of emotion right now. And on the one hand, you know, I'm overwhelmed and stressed trying to balance everything. And on the other, I'm grateful for the things that I have. And um, so I think you know, I relate to all of those comments. Well, um, just by looking at the whole gamut of emotions, I guess we know that families have always had stressors and challenges, but 
today, you know, with what's going on now, it's really, it's different. And it's kind of like a whole new layer of, um, of challenges. And, and I like that some people even say feeling blessed. So it's just both challenges and, uh, and new opportunities. So um, we're just here to explore how having this particular tool. So for those of you who are not from Ruler schools, Ruler is a, an approach for social and emotional learning that's primarily in schools all over the country and actually around the world. And, um, and among our many resources, we have four, four tools. And one of the tools is the charter. And the charter is what we're going to talk about today. And the charter really has to do with how do we create the kind of emotional climates that we want to have, whether it's in our schools, in our classrooms, even in our workplaces, or what we'll be talking about today in our homes. So for those of you who are having a great time at home, we hope that this just helps you be like gilding a lily and enhancing it. And for those of you who are feeling like you're ready to set the reset button and do something uh, to kind of rework what's going on at home, we hope that this is also helpful and supportive to you. So before we jump in, um, we just wanted to say that there's, there's really no such thing as an ideal or a perfect family, and that a family can be made up of whomever you consider to be your family and who, maybe whomever you're living with in your, in your house right now. Um, but what matters most is how we feel being a part of a family. And so what we've become aware of over the years is that um, Sometimes we're so immersed in one level of what's going on, but it helps to just sort of step up and ask the bigger questions like, how are you feeling? Like, how are you feeling right now as a part of our family? Um, and how would you like to feel? And this can be not only with, uh, with the kids, this can be also with adults that you're living with. Um, and, and then of course, you know, how might we, how might we, make things better. And if they're good, how might we even improve them and make them even? What are we doing that's good, that's working? And how can we even take it to the next level? So, um, so really this, this whole exploration of emotional climate, I, I was thinking as we were just preparing for this, I didn't tell Lisa I was gonna tell the story, but I'll never forget years ago, I was in a bookshop in Berkeley, California. And the owner of the bookshop just started yelling at, a, at an employee. Like he was saying things to shame this person who worked there. And, and everybody who was in the bookshop just looked around at one another and just thought like, what is going on? So the climate was horrible. And I thought, I never want to, I never want to come back to this. I thought this was such a great bookshop, but I never want to come back here just because of the emotional climate. And I think that that's, from looking at the other customers, I wasn't the only one who felt that way. And so the emotional climate of any place we know is, um, has a tremendous impact upon how we feel and whether we want to be there or whether we want to get out of there. <laughs> so um, it's a huge and important topic. I, I came across a, a, an article a couple of weeks ago written by Paul Bennett, who is the director of, he's the creative director of IDEO. And I just was so struck by how much it reminded me of families that I decided to share with you. And then I'll say a little bit about why, but so I'm just gonna read it, Wild Geese. First and foremost, the wild goose is never alone. It's part of a flock. They fly in formation and no goose is left behind. Second, by flapping their wings together, each bird creates an uplift for the others, allowing them to fly longer distances. And third, when the lead goose um, drops back into the flock, part of my words are cut off by the pictures, <laughs> um, it allows another um, to have uplift. And lastly, and to me most poignantly, the geese um, in the back honk to motivate those in the front to keep going. So I kind of had to cobble some of that together, but um, but I I I was struck by how you know, in the article went on to describe how geese like people are we're really fundamentally a collaborative, interdependent kind of species, and that we recognize the need for one another's presence and the need to work together, which of course describes families. Um, that having shared responsibility creates more resilience as a group. And, um, and I was just inspired to think that, um, 
that the charter actually like um, like being in a flock and like uh, in a flock where there is the leader understands that um, that leading has much to do with encouragement as it does with uh, like um, direction setting that the charter hopefully can help a family fly together better and um, and so it's my hope that we can create uplift for one another as we begin to learn more about and practice the family charter. So what is a family charter? And the charter is an agreement that details how everyone in a home wants to feel and what everyone agrees to do to have those feelings as often as possible. And we heard Catherine mention that it's designed to build and sustain a positive emotional climate. And when we say emotional climate in a home, we mean the feelings that we have when we're at home based on the interactions we have with and among our family members. There isn't a lot that we can control right now, but creating a family charter is a way that we can have agency in our own homes. It's a way that we can create the kind of environment in which we'd like to work and live. So after we agree on the behaviors or the feelings we'd like to feel and the behaviors that are gonna support those feelings, we write it down. And writing our, our charters down and displaying them in our homes is a way of making our emotional needs real for us and for our family members. Everyone's involved in creating a charter. It is a whole family process. Each person has an opportunity to share how they wanna feel. And then everyone comes together to agree on the behaviors you're going to include. And this holds everyone accountable for those behaviors. We decided on this charter together and we're all responsible for honoring our commitment. It's not set in stone though. A charter is a living document. And when I say that, I mean that families make a habit of checking in regularly on their charter and asking how it's going. Are we living up to our agreement? And if it's not working, revising it as needed. The charter is different than uh, rules and household rules, and, and those are important. Household rules are important for physical safety, for predictability, um, for routine and structure. But the charter is about emotional safety. It's about how we want to feel together, about our interdependence and our need to support each other. It's not what I can do for you or what you do for me, but what we do for each other. So there are many benefits to having a charter. Um, the first is that because everyone gets an opportunity to share um, what's important to them and how they feel, it helps us to understand the needs and the beliefs of our family members. For children and adolescents, that's important because they can have agency, a sense of agency and control in their own homes. And for parents, it can accommodate our needs as well. Um, I know for myself right now, I have two young boys. Um, something I need is short breaks by myself to maybe make a phone call to an adult, another adult outside of our home or to just be by myself for a moment. And so that's something I can build into my charter. And it's things like that, it's sharing what I need um, that reminds our children that we as parents and caregivers are human too. We have our own emotional needs. We have our identities beyond being a mom, a dad, a grandparent. And that encourages a mutual respect and acknowledgement of emotion. Also, when we're having the conversations about how we wanna feel at home, we can explain what those feeling words mean to us and why they're important. And that reinforces our family values. And we can make connection around those shared values. When we're talking about what matters to us and making it a commitment to uphold the needs of each of our family members, it strengthens our relationships and it promotes a greater well being in families. Catherine, you're on mute. Sorry, I muted it. How, how do you want to feel in your family? Um, we'd love if you would just share some of the feeling words that pop up for you in the chat box. Happy. And so we have happy, yep, <laughs> recognized, peaceful, understood, loved and appreciated, supported, acknowledged, heard, calm and safe, joyful, appreciated, special, understood.
loved, appreciated, included, happy, calm, appreciated, allowed space, respected, safe, and valued. Great. Secure. Yeah. So, um, so these, these words that you shared are words that come up often for families in writing a family charter. So what I'm going to do here is just take you through the basic process. And as Ashton said, we'll send this slideshow to you. And we also have a one page handout that just gives all the directions. So, um, so you don't, shouldn't need to feel like you have to write anything down. So the charter consists basically of, of two questions, two key questions. And the first one, how do we want to feel in our family? And the general process, sometimes people, you know, the family knows you're going to be having this, this meeting together, so people can be thinking about it. And when you sit down, each person writes down, you know, five to ten feelings, top feeling words that they'd like to feel when they're together at home. Or just um, even not together, there's ways you want to feel at home. And after doing that, and everybody has their words, then the, then the next um, step is to then share your words. And that, that initiates a conversation. So it will be eye-opening to see the kinds of words that um, your different family members say and, um, and for them to hear yours. And often that they'll be the same and some of them may be different, but it's really a time for conversation just to be curious about one another, like, wow, tell me more about why you chose that word. And, or, oh, hey, look, I have the same word that you do. So some of the words are bound to come up several times, and that will probably end up being one of the words on your charter. Other times, there may be words that are similar, so like uh, valued and appreciated. So that's an opportunity to talk as a family, like, well, what's the difference between valued and appreciated? And which one of those words comes the closest to how it is that we want to feel? Um, the next thing that after you've discussed all the words, then you're going to try to narrow them down so that you have about five words um, on each um, on your list. Looks like we popped forward, but I'll just keep Sorry, going. <laughs> um, so you want to narrow it down to you have about five words um, that you all agree upon. It doesn't matter if you have a few more, but it's easier to remember and follow the charter if you have about five. Um, and, and let's see. And I, and I wanted to just add that one of the things that I think is really, really important is that the process parallels the charter. So the spirit with which what you do it needs to be inclusive, everybody belongs, everybody has an equal voice and feels valued for the words and the feelings that they have while going through the process. Um, I've been in situations before where maybe the, whether it was at a school where the principal or the teacher thought that they had the final say or in families where the parents did, but kind of what's special about this is that um, just as there's going to be a shared responsibility to uphold it, there has to first of all be a shared responsibility for creating it. So once you've settled on your words, then the second, the second step or the second question is, how will we help each other have these feelings more often? And um, so for each word, you're going to discuss one or two behaviors that each family would need to do in order to have that feeling more often. And I'd say that this is easier said than done because you really need to get specific um, in order for it to operationalize it, to really make it real. And um, so, for example, if, the, if your word is we want to feel happy, and then people say, well, how are you going to, how, how will we feel happy more often? Well, if you were, if we're more nice to each other, that's, that's just not specific enough. You know, what does nice mean? So you need to break it down another level. So it might be more that if you, if, if as a family, you want to feel happy, then maybe you say, um, as a family, we agree that we'll share uplifting and positive stories together uh, three nights a week, or we'll have a game night, or something that you all uh, decide would increase your happiness level. Um, so, and let's just take a couple more words just to try to break it down, because this is really, this is really where the change happens. This is kind of where the rubber meets the road is, um, you know, do the behavior sh shift. 
So let's say a word, I think I saw a word respected. So for, for, a, for a word respected, you might say something like, we agree that when one person is talking to another, that you will actually give eye contact and listen. Or um, for um, what might be another one? for appreciated, that, um, that we really just remember to say please and thank you more often and express when we appreciate something, something that has been done for us um, or our, on our behalf. So just taking a moment to pause and really recognize that. I, I wanted just to say one more thing before I jump into putting it all together to another thought is um, just seeing the range of, of, um, of, in the ages of the kids that you have, I've done the family workshops around writing a charter and with little, with younger kids, like say in elementary school, they're so proud to do this. They feel such a sense of ownership and they, they love to stand up in front of the whole group and share their family charter. And, you know, they, they feel this sense of belonging and um, that they did this together with their family and a kind of sense of uniqueness. Adolescents aren't going to be like that. Um, but I've, I've watched them working with their parents or parent before creating a charter too. And it's often, it's a more serious process. Um, but if there's enough trust between you and your, um, and your teenagers, it can be really powerful because it's at a time when they want to have more say and they want to be able to have more, um, be able to shape what's going on more at home. And this really creates an opportunity for that. And also because as, because they're older, they can begin to see like, oh, wow, like I'm contributing to the emotional climate, not just at home, but in many other contexts. And I can also help to shape that. So that's empowering. So then the final process, the final um, step is to just put it all together. So this is a chance for families to be creative. You might write it all out on a big piece of chart paper, or maybe you have something smaller that you want to put on your refrigerator, but you can draw pictures, you can, um, you can put it in a, you know, a, in a garden or a ship or, you know, whatever you might want to do. But the important thing is that it has each feeling word. It has the behaviors that you've agreed upon. And each uh, member signs the charter. If, if you have a child who's a, um, an early writer and doesn't write their name yet, then they can put a thumbprint or some other mark, but it's important that everybody, everybody has agreed to it and, it and it shows that on the document. And then you need to display it prominently in your home so that you actually refer to it and use it and it's, it's something that's um, alive and a part of your daily life. So did anyone have any questions on the process? I think I saw a couple come through the chat. Um, one of them was, um, do you set up the, the norms of how you're going to have your charter meeting beforehand? And, and I really feel like that's a very important step in how you set up that conversation in the beginning. Um, you know, if the expectation is that everyone's going to be included and we're going to listen and value each other's contributions, then explicitly stating that from the beginning is really important. Um, and what Catherine mentioned as well is it can be challenging to say how we want to feel at home because what's unsaid is that we might not feel th that much of those emotions right now. And it's sometimes hard to hear that. Um, and being honest and open about that too is important from the get-go. Um, were, were there other questions? I just saw that one. Pop. Yeah, there are. Um, so another one is, how do you work across broad um, age ranges? Did you want to? I, I mean, I, uh, maybe maybe you can ask something more specific than that. You mean like if there are broad age ranges within the family? Yes, I would. I did see that once, and that was pretty interesting. Um, some of it really has to do with your skill as a as a parent, you know, or the caregiver as a, a facilitator. Um, but I think, again, like the, the spirit is to be, to create a feeling of inclusiveness and belonging. And that, um, that the behaviors, it might be that you need more than one behavior for each feeling word so that it can include a broader range. And that's fine too. So. Um, yeah, she said uh, she had a teenager and a kinder age, so. Yeah, and so, in, and it may even, you know, inspire some conversations, like sometimes, you know, 
sometimes, of course, younger kids often want to hang around the, their older sibling, and sometimes the older siblings feel like they're a pest. And, you know, and so how do you find that, um, how do you work with that in your family in a way that leads to really everybody feeling good and feeling like their needs are being met, but they're also staying connected? So those are part, those are, this is part of what the process is of creating a charter is that it opens up important discussions. You might need to set ground rules in the beginning of like, you know, in, when we had this conversation, we want to go into it with the spirit of being loving with one another and, and open and feeling like we can share our feelings and have conversations without any blame. So, um, because we're going to start, we're starting fresh to do, do things a little bit differently. Um, and another question, um, what happens when someone does not feel something on the charter? So we're actually going to get to that a little bit later in the presentation. So if we can hang on to that question for a few more slides, um, you know, I hope we'll, we'll address that question. And then the last one is, can family charter be done without involving one of the parents? Um, so you mean like, um, like one parent but the other parent isn't there. Um, I mean, I think, you know, again, it's just like uh, each family is unique uh, and you have your own kinds of dynamics, understandings or schedules. Um, so I, I think that it is important, even if not everybody can be there when you write it, if, if there's another member of the family who's gonna be participating and helping to uphold it, somewhere there needs to be an opportunity for that person to weigh in and be a part of it too. How you do that, I'm not sure. Um, so, okay. Seems like that's it for questions. And so here are, here are some sample family charters. Um, these are three different family charters that we've seen. And, um, and I think that one in the middle belongs to Elisa's family. It does, that's the Ladati family charter. Um, I am sitting across from it now. It is, pretty big. It's on whiteboard contact paper in my dining room. And I pass by it all the time on my way to the kitchen to get my 17th snack of the day, um, along with all my other family members. So how do you keep your family charter alive? Um, what works for us is we schedule regular uh, family meetings to review our charters. And we, we're doing this on a weekly basis at this time. Usually, um, at dinner at the end of the week, reflecting back on how it's going and if we're living up to our agreement that we made. Um, you can also be proactive and set a charter intention or a daily or weekly goal related to a part of the charter that you might find challenging to honor or a feeling word that you want to feel more of. And then, you know, the charter also provides an opportunity to, to share stories about feeling words that are on your charter. Um, so for example, we have the word loved on my family charter and um, we might share stories about a time that we felt loved, um, each of us. And that broadens and deepens, deepens our understanding of what our charter words mean. If you can be creative, um, we do charter shout outs at dinners. Usually it's my oldest uh, leading the charge and pointing out when somebody's lived uh, our charter in a special way. Um, Maybe you share poems and inspirational quotes, uh, send a group family email or a group text if everyone has cell phones, um, or just do acts of kindness and show appreciation for your family members. Um, Catherine mentioned to me when we were building this webinar that um, there was a Charter Champions, um, which is something that we used to do, um, previously did at the center. And um, could you share a little bit more about that? That was it was fun, you know. Like a lot of these things, they 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 work for a while, and then you need to change it up. But we had um, we had something where every week people would send in somebody who they thought at the center was particularly upholding the charter. One of the feeling words, one of the specific feeling words on the charter. And then there was a big shout out to that person in the newsletter. And there was a kind of a statue trophy that showed up on their desk. And even if it was a little bit corny, it was fun. And it really just did help. It was another way of helping to keep the charter alive. So as I mentioned before, um, the charter is not set in stone. It's a living document. And as a family, you can decide uh, to revise it as needed. 
Um, so you saw a picture of my family charter. That's the original one we made um, months ago. And that um, was in a time before social distancing and before balancing working from home and school at home and childcare and you know what our current reality is now. And, and that doesn't fully meet our needs as a family right now. If I'm being honest, we're in the process of revising it. Um, some things that are on that, that charter are just automatic and inherent to who we are as a family now, and so we don't need them anymore, and that's a sign of success. Um, but there's some things that I want to feel more of right now that I'm not feeling so much of um, as a part of our circumstances, and there's some behaviors that we want to add and change and adjust, and and that's okay. Um, you know, the charter, as a family charter, it's supposed to be revisited and revised and um, it's gonna evolve and change as we as individuals and as families evolve and change. But the charter only works if you use it. Um, creating a family charter or revising a family charter doesn't mean that you're never gonna have disagreements, that you're always gonna feel your charter feelings or um, there's never gonna be conflict. Um, those things are a part of family life and they're likely gonna happen. The charter is aspirational. It's what we strive to do. But there are gonna be times when our emotions are gonna get the better of us and we won't live our charter. And so what do we do then? So when you witness somebody breaking the charter, um, it's time to open a conversation, have a conversation about it. So it might be something like, that's, that's not living our charter. Um, and we made this charter together. We all agreed to it. So what can we do now? And what can we do in the future? But the point is to, to address that behavior head on and in a, a kind but direct way and, and refer to your charter, the behaviors and the emotions. And sometimes we're not gonna live our, our charter. So in the spirit of vulnerability and honesty, I'll say that lately, um, my tolerance for things like whining and um, the sibling squabbles that have always happened in my home is, is less than it, than it has been in the past. And on more than one occasion, I've, I've raised my voice. Um, and I don't like to yell. Um, it's not who my best version of myself as a parent is, um, but it's happened and it might happen in the future. There was one night after I lost my temper, I was walking you know, by, um, through my dining room into my kitchen, probably to get another snack. And my charter stared me right in the face. And there's one behavior that stuck out to me. It's that we will, and I'm trying to find it up there just to get the right wording. We'll use kind words in a calm voice. And when I saw that, and it was enough of a reminder to me that, wow, I just really didn't do that. Um, and to reflect on that behavior, to acknowledge it and to apologize, not for getting upset, but for the way that I express that in the moment. Sometimes I need my husband to call me on things and sometimes I call him on things or call my children on things and it can be really hard to hear that feedback. Um, but that's part of using and living by the charter. And so how do we start to ask ourselves some of those hard questions about, you know, when it's not going so well and, and taking that as an opportunity to self-reflect and to grow. So when we're building this family charter webinar, I found this quote um, and I really love it. I'm gonna move the um, windows here so I can read it to you. In truth, the family is what you make it. It's made strong, not by the number of heads counted at the dinner table, but by the rituals you help your family members to create, by the memories you share, by the commitment of time, caring, and the love you show to one another, and by the hopes for the future that you have as individuals and as a unit. So right now I'll ask you to reflect just to yourselves, what hopes do you have uh, for your family? What do you hope comes out of this time together? And when, one of my hopes for all of you would be that like the wild geese, the charter helps you flock together more as families and create uplift for one another. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, I think we can take a few. We probably have time to take a few questions if you have them. 
I, I want to just address one question that I think I, I might have seen flash across. It, it said something about younger children. And I worked with a family once where um, they were at the table and there was some kind of squabble going on. And the, the little girl got up, she walked over to the refrigerator where the, where the charter was posted, and she said, um, we are not living the charter right now. And it was very, it was, it was just kind of a jaw dropping moment for her parents who realized how deeply meaningful the charter writing process was to her and she took it very seriously. So I want to say also that if you, if you do this, we hope that you will take it very seriously um, as your children most likely will as well. It really is an opportunity. Um, so there was uh, one question, um, should this be part of creating the charter? What will happen when someone breaks the charter? So, um, so that actually, it, in the past, um, there was a question on the charter, you know, what will we do when uh, we disagree or when, when there are conflicts when we don't live the charter? Um, and well, that's not one of the questions we include on our charters now because we really look at it as an aspirational document. I still think there's value in having that conversation um, because then you're being proactive and prepared and kind of discussing your family norms and expectations about how you're going to treat each other when somebody breaks the charter or when there is a disagreement. Um, I think that conversation can be really valuable. Um, linking it to the, the words that you have on your charter and what you agree to do can be the context for that kind of conversation. Did you have something to add, Catherine? It looked like you wanted to. Oh, uh, yeah, I kind of did. Well. I, I was just remembering when I worked in a school, um, the principal that I worked with said she really loved that the charter freed her up a little bit because when there were conflicts, before we had a charter, people would often go to her. But now she could, she could say, What does it say in the charter? And often that meant people needed to go have the conversations, those difficult, the hard conversations with one another before um, to try to resolve it without going to her first. And so I'm thinking as parents, that might be a relief if before that might be one of your agreements is that talk to one another before you go run to um, one of your parents or caregivers. I don't see what any of the other, should we answer one more question? Sure. I'm just trying to catch up. <laughs> I, was answering, I was answering a question for somebody. Um, so th this has been coming up a couple of times. Um, I'm not sure if you guys will have, you know, any insight on this. Um, but what if um, the co-parent is not invested um, in a charter or um, helping to keep to it? Do you guys have any advice? So, I mean, I, I think my question would be to explore that a little further and, um, you know, what, what the reticence or the um, apprehension about creating a family charter or upholding it is, um, and just exploring that in conversation beforehand, because, um, you know, that might be really illuminating and how, how we, um, on what next steps that you take. Um, Often when we um, have apprehension about something, there's some other underlying emotion or um, thing kind of driving that, that, that reservation and, and exploring that in, in an open and, and non-judgmental way can kind of give us a better uh, indication of, of what next steps we, we have to take. Catherine, did you have something to add? I don't know. I think that that's a, that's a complicated it's a complicated question that feels to me in some ways too, too big for this without mm -hmm. knowing more about the situation. But I would say maybe one modification, it seems like a slippery slope to me to have one parent and not the other, but one modification might be a charter among the kids. Maybe they'd like to have a charter among themselves. Um, yeah. Um, there's also, um, I know that um, Mark um, Brackett and, and Robin Stern are doing, um, it's called another webinar, it's called Staying Sane at Home, Strategies for Regulating Emotions with Partners, Roommates, and Relatives, and maybe that um, could potentially be helpful. <laughs> um, and I can send you um, the link to potentially uh, register for that um, 
that will come with the slides or not, excuse me, not with the slides, but with this recording of the webinar um, in two business days. Um, I don't see. Everybody's really thanking you, saying that it was great. <laughs> great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you guys so much um, for, for this, for all sharing your insights on this topic. Um, and again, I'll just uh, note that um, that the recording will be sent um, to everyone uh, within the next few days. Um, and you can, there will also be a link shared with you um, for our upcoming webinars as well. Um, so you can look out and see what we have on the docket. Um, so we look forward to seeing you guys at the next one. Thank you guys so much. Okay. Bye. Bye.